Hey family, welcome back to Hope Church Online. So good to be with you. We are jumping into a new series, The Kingdom. Looking at the kingdom of Jesus, the kingdom of God, through the lens and the narrative of Matthew, a disciple, a tax collector, someone that nobody thought would be in the inner circle of Jesus' disciples. And yet he's got something to say to us about the kingdom of God. Not our kingdom, not our world, but how we fit and what is our calling in his kingdom. So I'm ready to jump into it. It's so good to be back with you. Man, I have missed you. I've got a verse out of Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. And it says, But seek first his kingdom, that's the kingdom of Jesus, and his righteousness, and all these things, things that we put our cares and our trust in, will be given to you as well because our hearts turn to Christ. Our hearts start to reflect what his heart desires. And so that's what we're going to be looking at, the kingdom of Jesus. Join us and I'm going to pray. Father God, thank you so much for your kingdom, Lord Jesus. Thank you for calling us to so much more. Thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, even as I think through the chapters that I've read through Matthew already, uh, I'm just, I'm so grateful that you call us to a greater life, to excellence. Um, Holy Spirit, that you're here walking with us through this uh, faith. And it's so, uh, Father God, we're so selfish when we look at ourselves, when we look at our world, when we look at things that are fleeting. And Lord, you, you have so much more for us. Father God, thank you for your mercy that when we look at things um, in our worlds, Father God, when we have anxieties, Father God, when we put our cares into our frail world, you, you're still there with us, beside us, calling us to an excellent life. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your, your soft and gentle hand, your soft and gentle voice. Thank you, God, and Father, for your patience. I pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Hello, and it is so good to be back with you. I always have mixed emotions when I have people filling in for me or coming to speak. One part, I love being able to have friends and introduce them to you, other pastors in the area. At the same time, I really miss opening up God's Word with you. So I'm going to invite you to grab your Bible, and we are beginning the study of the book of Matthew. And I am so excited. I'm hoping that that is communicated clearly to you, how excited I am to finally be starting the book of Matthew. But I don't think we can put aside, and I think it's very important, and the reason that I had David and Clay speak for me was to start to help us picture the kingdom of God, that we would start to get a visual of what that actually looks like, that we would start to understand why it is such an important theme throughout the Bible. And so I want to go back and think about David. David did such a great job of taking Genesis to Acts to Revelation and showing the big picture of the kingdom of God. And I love how he said that the kingdom of God is anywhere that God's will is being done. That things that part of God's creation are being redeemed back to him to represent the kingdom of God here on earth and invite people into it with us. I love how Clay took it again a little further and demonstrated us that the kingdom of God is us playing out what God has called us to do. Through the Holy Spirit working in us, doing his work in us to make us better representatives of him as we carry it out. So in us and through us to represent the kingdom of God. And now each and every one of us have a very specific role to play that God has called us to when we make Jesus the forgiver of our sins and the leader of our life. That now we get to play a part in the kingdom of God. God. And so that brings us to the book of Matthew. And Matthew is this awesome bridge from the Old Testament into the New Testament. It takes where we just were in Ezra, Nehemiah, Haggai, and Malachi, and now 400 years have gone by, roughly. So from 400 years till now, that's the Mayflower hitting the beach up in New England. And now here we are. So that amount of time, that same 400 years, and this country has changed somewhat in the last 400 years. So imagine how long of a time period has gone by from Malachi until Jesus shows up. 400 years. So there's things that are going to be mentioned in Matthew that we've never heard of before. Pharisees, Sadducees, synagogues. What are these things? 
they all came to existence in those 400 years. There's a lot of stuff we're going to cover in Matthew. <laughs> Very excited about it. So why Matthew? Why are we getting into Matthew? As we observed over the last year or my own lifetime, something that there has always been a problem with here on earth, something that as hopefully you're doing your Bible reading, you've seen in the Old Testament, something that we see in the New Testament, something that we've seen throughout history, something that we are seeing portrayed in front of us right now, is people trying to find identity in something. So why are we going to talk about the kingdom of God? You see, we all ascribe to a kingdom. There are kingdoms that we want to be associated with, whether it's a country, whether it's a nation, whether it's a political view. Uh, we try to find our identity in these kingdoms. We try to find our identity in jobs or occupations or titles or marital status or how many kids we have. We try to find our identity in all of these things. And we try to let things define our identity through different initials or numbers or personality tests or what Disney princess are you. And we try to let whatever it is try to define us and tell us who we are because we're looking for our identity. And we want to find our identity in something. We ascribe ourselves to a kingdom. No matter what, you do it without even trying. We all have found ourselves in some kingdom. And so I think it is very important that as we go through this, we look at God's kingdom. We look at aligning ourselves and how do we align ourselves with God's eternal kingdom as we live out his kingdom here on earth. That's why we've titled this series, Your Kingdom Come. It's part of the Lord's Prayer that you'll find in Matthew chapter 6. He says, Your kingdom come, as Jesus is teaching his disciples and teaching those listening, they said, how do we pray? And he says, I'll tell you. And part of it is your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's fascinating how lightly we take the Lord's Prayer. We don't really understand the gravity of what Jesus is telling us to pray. When we're praying your kingdom come, understand we are his kingdom representatives here on earth. If we know Christ, we are his representatives to demonstrate to the world around us what his kingdom will look like. The word kingdom is used 54 times in the book of Matthew. The word kingdom plays such an important role, and Matthew wants to emphasize that over and over and over again. No other book talks about the kingdom as much as Matthew does, quoting what Jesus is saying, demonstrating how we are to live, how we are to represent the kingdom of God here on earth. Now, another part of Matthew that we'll talk about in a little bit is Matthew was Jewish. And Matthew, the book, was written very specifically to Jews. It doesn't mean that you should put it away by any means because there's so much. But there's words that he uses that mean a lot more to his Jewish audience than they would necessarily to us. For instance, he uses the son of David eight different times to describe Jesus. And that is used because he's demonstrating that King David, the line of, of kings that God chose, that God anointed David. And so the, the kind of, in the, the Jewish nation, they kind of excuse Saul. That was man's pick, got it wrong. But David was the man selected by God, anointed. And so his is the real um, kingly line. And then Jesus is the son of David. And Matthew is trying to express to his Jewish brothers and sisters that he is the true king of his people. So when he refers to them as son of David, he's saying, this is the true king. Come from the right line. Now, Matthew also does such a great job of bridging the Old Testament into the New Testament. In fact, I don't think we actually started planning on doing the book of Matthew until we were in Ezra and Nehemiah. And we realized, I think we have to go to Matthew next. It just makes sense. So there's this beautiful bridge of taking all this culture, all this tradition, all these beliefs from the Old Testament, the writings of Moses and, and the prophets, and he takes all of those and Matthew shows and he combines those into the New Testament. In fact, he uses 61 Old Testament references to explain exactly why Jesus is and why Jesus is doing and why he was born and why he fled to Egypt and why he ended up in Nazareth. He uses the Old Testament to explain everything that Jesus was doing, fulfilling prophecy after prophecy after prophecy, again, showing the Jewish people who would have known the Old Testament why Jesus was exactly 
who he said he was. And all of these truths still hold true to you and myself today because we can still understand that Jesus is exactly who he says he is. That we can put our faith in him because his word is truth. And so Matthew, by no accident, was placed at the very beginning of the New Testament to bridge into the rest of the New Testament. And so much of what you read in Paul and Peter's and John's writings and the other authors of the New Testament, you can go back into Matthew and use Matthew as a filter to go back into the Old Testament to help us understand that the Bible is one complete story. Hopefully, as you're doing the Bible reading in the Read Scripture app, if you haven't started, now's a great time after this message. Start now and you'll see this beautiful picture of the kingdom of God being portrayed so that we know our role, so that we can find our identity in Christ. So let's jump in. And today I just want to start as an intro to Matthew. I think it's so important. And maybe you picked this up in Nehemiah when I talked about in my head, I make movies of the books I study and I cast different stars and Nehemiah was played by Dwayne The Rock Johnson. I haven't quite picked out a character yet for Matthew, but the truth is not much is known about Matthew. Very little is known about Matthew. And we'll talk about that more in just a minute. But I think it's so important to understand his background, to understand why he chose the things to write about that are so important. It's also a good way to remember the end of the book of John. When we finished in John, John just said, these are just a few of the things Jesus did. If I wrote down everything I saw Jesus do, there are not enough books in the world to contain his words and actions. So as we go through Matthew, understand there is a very specific purpose. It isn't necessarily written in chronological order as some of the other like uh, Luke and Mark are written in, but it plays such an important role. And I think as we start to understand who Matthew is and understands Matthew's passion, we'll start to see why he found the things important that he did. So, in order to understand Matthew, let's turn to the book of Mark. You know I love to do that. Mark chapter 2, starting in verse 13. It says, Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. By the way, Levi is interchangeable with Matthew. A lot of people had this different names, even though they were the same person. So let me clarify that. He saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. That last part is such a huge promise, and I'm so thankful that Jesus didn't come to call the righteous, but he came to call the sinners. So what I want to do is I want to look at this dichotomy of Matthew, these two different parts, and start to understand the confusion that Matthew probably felt as his occupation, as his heritage, what that would have meant to Matthew when we see him follow Jesus. First thing we see is Matthew is a tax collector. A tax collector, right off the bat, they were basically legalized thieves. What would happen is the Roman government would take over different countries as they were conquering the world. And they would just set up different tax systems. And they had several different tax systems in place. The fact that Levi, or Matthew, is sitting in a tax collector's booth probably meant that he would have been on the northern side of Israel in Galilee. And there was a road that would have gone from Damascus all the way into Egypt that passed by Jerusalem. And so these tax collectors, Matthew, would have been sitting in a booth and he would have been basically like a toll road. Anybody that passed through, he would charge them. And I don't know the charging system, whether it was based on the size of the cart or the animal or the person, but what ended up happening, and it was actually somewhat rare for people from the country to become tax collectors for the Roman government, is they could tax whatever they wanted in some cases. And so the Jewish people in most countries that were kind of defeated by the Romans and didn't want to be part of the Roman world, they hated the tax collectors. And so here is Matthew, who's a tax collector, but yet he's 
Jewish. And so Matthew is completely disowned by his people. Why? Well, because he was sitting in a Roman government booth and he had the power of the Roman military behind him and he could enforce whatever he wanted because Rome didn't care. They were making money off of it. Now, more than likely, Matthew is coming from money because in order to have that type of a privilege, you would have to make a bid saying, I will give the Roman government this much money and then collect this percentage for them. And the Romans just went with the highest bidder. And so Matthew is a agent of the Roman government. So Matthew is completely disowned by the Jewish people. In fact, anytime you see tax collectors use, it is a derogatory term. And you see the Pharisees who held themselves in very high esteem, as did the Jewish people, for their ability to follow the laws that not only God wrote, but all the extra ones they added to it to make sure they were really righteous. And the Pharisees would always say, you sinners and tax collectors. A lot of times it was used um, in unison with the prostitutes and tax collectors, or they were just as outcast as they could possibly be. Um, they would have been considered collaborators with the Roman government. And it's interesting because Matthew would have probably come from money, but then now he's just adding to his fortune as a tax collector. Whenever we see tax collectors, think of Zacchaeus, who was a, a chief of tax collectors. They are always wealthy individuals. They have plenty of money. And we see that because as soon as he follows Jesus, he has a big banquet at his house. But who shows up? Tax collectors and sinners. The sinners could have included many different things. So it more than likely was prostitutes or people that were just the outcasts because of how open their sin was, that everybody was no doubt they were sinners. So really the only people that Matthew is friends with are other tax collectors or people that in some ways you are paying to hang out with you, to be with you. And he invites Jesus into that setting and Jesus takes his disciples there. Why? Because Jesus came for the sinners. He came to demonstrate their need for him. And so here's Matthew, a wealthy man sitting in his toll booth and along comes Jesus. So that's Matthew as the tax collector. But this is the dichotomy part. The other part of Matthew is Matthew was a Jewish man. Matthew seems to have been highly educated in Jewish writings and traditions. He seems to know the Torah and he knows the prophets. And now you start to get this sense of Matthew in a different way. He loves his Jewish heritage. He is glad that he's Jewish. And it seems that through his writing that he would have known them. And he may have even been wealthy enough to own his own scrolls because tax collectors weren't allowed at the temple. They weren't allowed at the synagogue. So his study would have had to have been done privately if, in fact, that's what he was doing. Uh, it would have been difficult to follow Jewish law, though, because you are despised by the Jews. The Jews hate you. The Jews, and again, we talked about this uh, two months ago, but there was the group called the Zealots, and their job or their mission they thought from God was to kill Roman soldiers, or if they could corner a tax collector and kill them, they would carry daggers. That's what they would do. That's how much they were hated, was it was viewed as a good thing to kill a tax collector. So there are people literally that want him dead, and he's just making money off of his own people. So he is absolutely despised. I can't emphasize that enough. But it seems that Matthew is familiar with Jesus. Because when Jesus shows up, he knows who he is. Now, Jesus traveled quite a bit up and down the road. And maybe as Jesus is traveling and all these people are following him, Matthew's thinking, I got to know what that guy's doing. I want friends and that guy seems to have a lot of followers. How's he doing it? And it seems that Matthew was somewhat familiar with Jesus's teachings. But the book of Matthew demonstrates how well he knows the customs and tradition of the Jewish leaders, as well as tying to Jesus together with the Old Testament. He knows it. He seems to be highly intelligent, and tax collectors had to be. It wasn't a small thing to tax people and to keep track of everything. So he was a very intelligent man. But Matthew, as again from that Jewish perspective, explains Jesus as king. He knows the kingly line. He knows the heritage that we'll see next week. But now Matthew wants the people to know that Jesus is king. 
And so what happens? You have Matthew the tax collector, despised by his people, but you have Matthew the Jewish man who wants to fit in with his people. And he's kind of this man without an identity. He's wrapped up, he chose being a tax collector because of the amount of money. But yet all of his own people despise him and hate him. The Roman government would have looked down on him being a Jew. So he's trying to make friends with the Roman kingdom and they won't have him. He's trying to make friends with the Jewish kingdom and they won't have him. And he finds himself with just other tax collectors and sinners. And then Jesus shows up. Then Jesus says, Matthew, follow me. And it's so symbolic if he just walked out of the tax collector's booth and followed Jesus. He gave up everything and it changed his life. Then we get to see Matthew, the disciple of Jesus. Matthew, the kingdom representative of the heaven on earth. And this Matthew, he is willing to leave everything behind. He just gets up and walks away. And then he invites his friends to meet Jesus as well. He understands the difference that Jesus has made in his life and he gets everybody together and he throws a banquet and Jesus and the disciples are there and the Pharisees show up. And we'll talk about them in a couple of weeks. But he wants other people to know Jesus right away. Matthew found his identity in Jesus. And it changed everything. Now again, little is known about Matthew. A little is known about what he did after his conversion, after uh, Jesus left earth. We know that he wrote a book, but little is known about him as a person. However, his book that he wrote, that he put together, was probably the most widely distributed book of the early church. Most churches were based off of Matthew's writings of who Jesus was. Most people understood who Jesus was and what he wanted and how they were to form this church together and how they were to live based off the book of Matthew. In fact, books, manuscripts of Matthew have been found all over Africa, as far as India, up into Europe. And they think that this was just such a widely distributed book before Paul was even on the scene, that that is how the church came to be, was based off this book. So it's very important to remember that although we don't know much about Matthew, what God called him to do is still being used today to demonstrate the kingdom of God. Uh, Matthew, again, seems to have a wonderful grasp on just what the kingdom of God is and how we are supposed to live it out. He got to watch Jesus firsthand do this. Of the four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Matthew and John are the ones that were disciples. And so they were with Jesus. And although Luke and Mark are taken from eyewitness accounts, Matthew is writing again about what he saw Jesus do. He's writing of what he heard Jesus say and told us how we should live. Now, historically, not biblically, but historically, Matthew was known as always having a huge emphasis to want to reach the Jews for Christ. He wanted to point his people. And so it is thought that he may have gone as far as India. He may have traveled throughout Egypt and Ethiopia. All of those countries would have had Jewish people that fled under King Herod or different rulers to get out or they moved. But it was said that he was always finding the Jewish people. He so badly wanted the Jewish people to know that Jesus was king. And I find it fascinating that you take someone like Matthew, who is completely disowned and completely despised by his own people because of his occupation. He couldn't fit in with the Roman government. And yet Jesus showed up and Jesus gave him this new identity. And then the love of Jesus caused Matthew to passionately pursue the very people that rejected him, the very people that rejected and crucified Christ, he chased after them. He wanted them to know what it was to know Jesus because he had experienced it in his own life. And he couldn't imagine having to live through life, having seen or heard or witnessed the Messiah, Jesus the King, here on earth to establish his kingdom. He wanted all of his brothers and sisters in the Jewish custom to come to that saving knowledge and to be representatives of the kingdom alongside of him. He had such a deep desire and love for the people that once rejected him. And his book, his writing was used to establish the church that is still going strong, that the gates of hell cannot prevail against. Matthew wanted to fit in, but wasn't accepted by anyone. He only found his identity and purpose in life 
when he turned them over to Jesus. That is how I view Matthew. That is what we see of Matthew in this passage. I think that is how we can relate to Matthew. Because I think all of us have been in that boat. We're trying to fit in. We're trying to find a place that will accept us. We feel like no matter where we turn, no matter how good of friends we think we have, they reject us, they use us, they get what they want out of it. We're looking, we're trying to find our identity. We keep putting our identity in different things that keep failing us. I think we can relate to Matthew. But then Jesus enters the picture. If you're watching this and you have never put your faith in Jesus, if you have never made him the forgiver of your sins and leader of your life, understand it changes everything. The gospel changes everything about our lives. It changes our purpose. It changes our identity. And that is what we see with Matthew. So when Matthew is documenting these things and he's writing these things, understand he knows Jesus. He's heard Jesus and he wants other people to know him as well. He wants other people to know how do you represent the kingdom so that other people can come into that beautiful relationship with the Savior, with the Messiah, with the King of all creation. Here's what I want you to take home. You're either trying to build God's kingdom or you're trying to build your own kingdom. And you cannot do both at the same time. Matthew was trying to help the Roman kingdom. He wanted to help the Jewish kingdom. And both rejected him. And then he found Jesus. And then his view of kingdoms changed. All the other kingdoms didn't matter. It was just representing the kingdom of God. You have a choice. I have a choice. Every day we have a choice of what kingdom we are trying to build. Are we trying to build our own kingdom? Matthew was great at it. He was wealthy. He had no friends. He had to pay his friends. But he could throw a banquet like none other. So where are you? What is your identity found in? Who are you trying to please? What are you chasing after? Are you trying to build your own kingdom? Or are you trying to build God's kingdom? Again, this is why we are calling the series Your Kingdom Come. So that the focus isn't on building our kingdom, but the focus is on building God's kingdom. Allowing him to work in us and through us to establish his kingdom on earth as we point people back to him. As we help redeem people that can only be, de be redeemed through the blood of Christ. But here's the truth. Here's the tough part. Your day-to-day -day actions define what kingdom you are serving. Your day-to-day -day actions define what kingdom you are trying to build. Your day-to-day -day actions are showing in how we spend our time, how we spend our money, how we invest in our relationships, the things that are important to us. They are constantly telling us what kingdom we have placed the most importance on. And we cannot build both kingdoms at the same time. The second thing I want you to think through is that Jesus continually calls the least likely disciples to build his kingdom. I've heard different people referenced as the least likely disciple, whether it's Paul or Peter or Matthew. Here's the thing. Outside of Jesus, everyone's a sinner. Everyone is in need of a savior. Everyone is in need of a king. Everyone is looking for a place to find their identity. Everyone is looking for their purpose in life. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is always the answer. And so, yes, every single human being is the least likely disciple. All of us are undeserving. All of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short of what God has called us to. So you and myself are all the least likely disciples. And this isn't something that only happened with Matthew. This isn't something, now as we've been reading through the Old Testament, we see over and over again, Moses wasn't it. He wasn't perfect. And throughout the Old Testament, person after character after person after character, they all fail. Why? To point us to Jesus. Jesus comes. He takes our sin on himself. He takes it to the grave so that we no longer have to suffer the consequences from our sin. He rises from the dead, defeating death. And now we can call out to him, asking him to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we can become part of his kingdom. 
we can become his servants, that we now get to be his disciples. Just as Matthew became a, a disciple of the kingdom, a disciple of Jesus, that is what we are now called into, to represent his kingdom here on earth. Jesus did what only Jesus could do, and he is still in the business of calling the least likely people to be his disciples. So I am excited to continue in this study. I am excited to walk along with you as we get to see this beautiful picture of the kingdom of God, of discipleship, of all the different things that Jesus is demonstrating of how we are to live in his kingdom. And may our prayer be, your kingdom come. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for the word that you have given us in Matthew. Lord, that you saw fit to write to us so that we know how to represent you here on earth. That we know how to be a, a player in your kingdom. Lord, I pray that you work in us and through us and that our prayer is that your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Pastor Rob, for that word. I wrote down a few points. He said, our day-to-day -day actions define what kingdom we are serving. We are either trying to build God's kingdom or our kingdom, and it's impossible to do both at the same time. And then Pastor Clay, last week, he says, we carry the kingdom into all the places we go. That's wherever we live, work, and play. And so may Jesus the King find us faithful in carrying and reflecting his worth and his kingdom and his plan into all the places that we go with, all the people that we interact with as we move, not just today, not just throughout this week, but as we live because he's calling us to more. Be blessed. Can't wait to see you next week.